All right, folks, why don't we uh, start back up again? Um, it's 11 of two, seems like a good time to start. So let's talk about linguistic relativity and linguistic determinism. So we ended by suggesting that language influences thought. Um, we've suggested that whether it's metaphor or inference uh, or the kind of things that we refer to as gaslighting, for example, that language can direct thinking uh, in pretty substantial ways. But how far does that go? Um, one possibility that was explored in the middle of the 20th century uh, was the idea that your native language, whatever language you first grow up speaking, um, ha has the ability to really determine how you see the world. It can determine your perceptual abilities. So it isn't just the case that you can cause people to think about one thing or the other, but that the language that you speak makes it possible for you to perceive some things that other people can't. Uh, and that creates constraints and limitations. So we refer to this in the literature in, so, in a lot of different ways. It's sometimes referred to as linguistic determinism, which is kind of the strongest possible interpretation of this theory, that language determines what you can think about. It can be referred to as linguistic relativity, which is a slightly weaker version of the same theory. The idea that they, you should expect you should expect to see relative differences between people if they speak a different language, uh, so that there will be these differences will be relative uh, to the native language a person speaks. It's sometimes referred to as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis for the two researchers, um, Edward Sapir and Benjamin Whorf, who are most closely associated with this idea. The one that's probably the most well known is Benjamin Whorf, uh, who suggested that we dissect nature along lines laid down by our native language. Uh, categories and types that we isolate from the world of phenomena, we don't find there because they stare every observer in the face. On the contrary, the world is presented in a kaleidoscope flux of impressions, which has to be organized by our minds. That's kind of straightforward. I mean, it's a little bit, it's a little fanciful to say it that way, but it's kind of what we've been saying all along, right? There's a lot of information out there and we've got to be able to organize it quickly into concepts and categories and words and ideas so that we know what's going on. Then he says, um, and this means largely by the linguistic systems of our minds. So he's making the claim that the organizational structure in mental life is language, right? That language is how you think. An internal thought is a language. And then he says, we cut nature up and organize it into concepts. And I only bolded that just to remind you that he's referring to Plato's idea that you uh, dissect nature and cut nature at its joints. So he's suggesting that rather than Plato's idea that there are joints, natural ways to cut the world, he suggests we do it by virtue of the language that we have. That's actually the most important part. It's not that the joints are there, it's that we have our language to do the cutting. We cut nature up, organize it into concepts and describe significances as we do, largely because we're parties to an agreement to organize it in this way. An agreement that holds throughout our speech community and is codified into the patterns of our language. All observers are not led to the same physical evidence or led by the same physical evidence to the same picture of the universe, unless their linguistic backgrounds are similar or can in some way be cal calibrated. So the suggestion is that different groups of people who speak different native languages might have different pictures of the universe because of their language. That language is the knife that you use to cut the universe up into concepts. And if you don't speak the same language, you might have different concepts. Uh, if our words are used to refer to different groups of things and different categories and different ideas, different labels, uh, then it means that we may not be seeing things exactly the same as someone who speaks a different language. So it's a pretty strong claim that language is the determiner of thought and perception. 
Uh, and let's talk about what this means. So Worf has the suggestion, came up, this is possibly not an accurate story, but it's the story that is often associated uh, with Worf because Worf before being a linguist was an insurance adjuster uh, and was actually a chemist by training. Um, and one of the things that he noticed is that when uh, industrial groups, so he was an industrial insurance, uh, industrial chemist working for an insurance company and noticed that when certain kinds of things were described as being empty by individuals, it had a different meaning to different kinds of people. So if you see a drum of gasoline uh, and you describe it as being empty, uh, what does that imply? Well, to some people that might imply that you've used all the fuel out of that canister, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, they're, that it's safe to smoke around, right? Because uh, there might be fumes uh, still, and that's actually what's flammable in this case. And one of the things that he was noticing was that people were being unsafe around canisters of fuel that weren't really empty. So when somebody said this can is empty, what they meant, the concept, the language that they were using and the concept that they were trying to activate was, we've filled up all the vehicles from this canister, so we can't use it anymore, it's empty, right? Uh, we've got to connect the system to a different canister. What they didn't mean was that it's safe to stand around when it's empty and toss a cigarette butt into it. And so that idea suggests that there might be more, there might be other ways to talk about the same observable universe. One group of people sees the canister and says they're empty. The other group of people sees the same canister and says they're not really safe. They're not empty enough to be safe around. Uh, so that idea or that concept of emptiness is slightly different. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, when I uh, was teaching both of my uh, daughters to drive when they were around 16, I uh, got into a conversation about why nobody stops at the yellow light. Um, how many people stop at a yellow light? Don't all put your hands up at once. How many people don't stop at a yellow light and just kind of coast on through and just sort of hope? But we go at a green light, right? And we stop at a red light. The problem has to do with the language. When you see a red light, what does it mean? What's the word that comes to mind? Stop, right? I mean, that's the only word, right? Red means stop. And green means go. What does yellow mean? What's the one word that you associate with yellow? Anybody? Oh, no. Slow down. So that's one possibility. Slow down. Are there other possibilities that associate with them? So it's a little bit, it's already two words. And it's already a little vague. Caution. So you might just need to be, so you can slow down. You might need to express some caution. Um, but we don't have a clear behavior, as clear of a behavior or a single word concept uh, like we do with uh, red and green. And that seems to be one of the problems. The Highway Safety Act, uh, so according to the law in the province, Red means you must stop. Green means you may go. Yellow means, and this is what the law says, you must stop if you can do so safely. Otherwise, go with caution. So you can see that that particular light has a lot of ambiguity legally defined. It means stop or go. It means maybe with caution. So you must stop. And that seems unambiguous. Must. You must stop if you can do so safely. Well, I mean, that's kind of true here too. I wouldn't stop if it was unsafe. Um, otherwise go with caution. So it's leaving a lot up to the driver, a little bit too much. And that's why a lot of accidents potentially, you know, that's why accidents happen on the yellow light, right? Somebody thinks, well, I should just go. Uh, I, I, can, I can do so safely. I'm always driving with caution. So I'm driving with caution now and I can go through. And then it turns red and somebody else is turning or someone's walking across uh, and you see an accident that happens there. So the yellow light's really dangerous. And one possibility is that we don't have a single word that goes with it. Slow down is one possibility. Uh, be careful is another possibility. The official possibility is stop or go. Um, if we all just said you must stop, at yellow and remain stopped at red, perhaps maybe that would be less ambiguous. We might see less accidents, not in London because the drivers in London are really bad. Um, you've probably noticed that if you drive in London. So it's not clear that this is the only problem we have here. 
But this is the Worfian idea that without a label and without a word and a lang linguistic thing that we all agree on, we're not sure what it means. Some of us think it means go. Some of us think it means stop. Some of us think it means go slowly. And the Highway Tra Tra Traffic Safety Act says you must stop if you can do so safely. So there are some stronger and weaker versions of this theory. Uh, this weak version, this idea that's relativity, suggests that there's structural differences between languages, right? Different native languages, different languages in the world use different words um, to describe the objects and concepts. And sometimes the boundaries of those objects and concepts differ, right? Uh, the, the range of things that's referred to in one language is different than the range of things that's referred to in another language. Um, so structural differences between language systems will in general be paralleled by non-linguistic cognitive differences that are kind of unspecified. We don't really know. We just assume that if people speak a different language, there will be some cognitive differences as well. They might see uh, different, they might group things differently or they might prioritize things uh, differently or they might view con context more than ob for objects in the foreground or they might view individual causes uh, more than contextual causes. So there are gonna be some differences. We assume that that's the case. The stronger version suggests the structure of anyone's native language influences or fully determines the worldview uh, he will acquire. I guess it's they will acquire anyone. This is what Brown and Lennonberg said in the 50s. Uh, he will acquire as he learns the language. I guess that's already a linguistic shift. In the 1950s and 1960s, uh, a lot of speakers and writers uh, used he as the generic uh, pronoun, which of course is a masculine pronoun. Um, so we would normally say, uh, determines the worldview they will acquire, uh, sort of this uh, unspecified or uh, uh, either an unspecified or a single um, singular they. Uh, for cases like this. At the same time, people were wondering how far does this idea go? So it's one thing to suggest that maybe we differ in terms of how we view full tanks of gasoline or what we say about a yellow light on a stoplight. But if you really wanna test whether or not someone's native language determines their worldview, you wanna see if it determines perception, especially something that seems to be fundamental and one of the obvious places to go is color because different languages have different numbers of color terms. Some languages have four or five, other languages have six. Uh, some languages have as few as two different color terms. So basic color terms that refer to a whole category of things and that anything more complicated than that is gonna have modifiers and connections. So lots of languages have different ways to describe the observable universe of colors, but colors are chemically and physically determined, right? We have rods and cones in our visual system that help us uh, see the color in the world, which is reflected off of the chemical composition of objects. So in terms of its objective appearance, color is, can be described chemically and it can be described physically. So if people's native language, which can vary in the terms of, in, in terms of the number of different ways color can be labeled and described, if that changes the way you see color, then it suggests that this linguistic determinism goes really far. It limits the way you can perceive things. It maybe makes it impossible for you to see color differences or struggle to see color differences because you don't have the words for it. So, uh, in the 1960s and into the 1970s, uh, cultural anthropologists were really interested in how many different color terms languages have. Uh, and Paul Berlin um, uh, and his colleague, uh, I can't remember Kay's first name, Edward Kay maybe? Paul Berlin and Edward Kay. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case, I cannot remember. So Berlin and Kay suggested uh, that there are at most 11 possible basic color terms across all of the languages that they've surveyed. Um, and by basic, they mean things that are monolexemic. In other words, it's a single word. So uh, we might refer to these in English as black and white and red and green, yellow, blue, brown, purple, pink, orange, and gray. What we don't refer to are things like light blue, 
because that's not monolexemic. That's not a single word. Another thing we might assume is a basic color term. And by basic, we're also referring to the same kind of basic categories that we talked about last week. So the first thing that comes to mind when you see the color red is not uh, dark red or light red, it's red, right? So it's monolexemic. Uh, it's not included in another color term. So crimson is a type of red, for example. So crimson is not a basic color term because it is part of the overall category red. Um, its application, so a basic color term is one for which regardless of the language, it can't be restricted to a narrow class of objects. It has to be generic. So it has to be the color itself, as opposed to blonde, which is a color that we refer to things, you know, like people's hair can be blonde, uh, wood can be blonde in color, uh, different kinds of beer can be blonde uh, in color. Um, and it has to be salient for everyone, uh, psychologically salient. So you can't just say the color of my grandmother's freezer uh, or the color of my brother's car. That's not usable for anyone else other than you and your brother. So this is what constitutes basic color terms. Single words, not included in other color terms, not a narrow class of objects, and it's psychologically salient for everyone who speaks that language. And they discovered some really interesting things. First of all, all languages contain terms for black and white. Regardless of what language they surveyed, even if the language only had two terms, it usually corresponded to dark things and light things. So what we might refer to in English as black and white. So every language has a term for dark things. Every language has a term for the absence of color uh, for light things. Some languages they, they, they surveyed, had only three basic terms. And in any language they surveyed, the third term beyond just black and white was always red, uh, which kind of makes sense too, because red seems like it would be an adaptively important color to know about, right? It's the color of heat. Uh, it's the color of blood. Um, it's an important color for most humans. I feel like I'm gonna be stuck with red on my face and my nose for the next few days, oh, which is really, it's really kind of bumming me out. I have to be honest, this hurts a lot. Um, so if a language contains four terms, they found that the fourth term, it's always black, white, red, and then it's either green or yellow. Again, this seems reasonable, right? If you're building a color vocabulary, dark and light are important. Red is important for humans because of the con connotation with uh, living, you know, with human blood and with uh, fire and all sorts of things that are really important for basic human uh, society. Green and yellow is important too because that's sort of the color of things that grow around you, right? The color of things that you're going to uh, eat and garden and the, the, na the natural environment. If it's five terms, then it's always black, white, red, green, yellow. And then the sixth one, we don't, it's not until we get languages that have six terms that we find something that isn't sort of a, a, a natural language or a natural environment color that's very common, and that's blue. So blue doesn't show up until languages have developed six different terms. And beyond that, that's a little bit more vagueness. Brown shows up there, and then these purple, pink, orange, and gray uh, usually show up in languages that have more uh, color terms. So those first five or six are really consistent. Uh, and blue seems to be the one uh, that is, um, is the first color that's kind of developed beyond these living thing type colors, uh, plants and animals and so on. That's not to say that there aren't blue animals, there just aren't many blue animals. It's really interesting too, because, um, and I would recommend, by the way, this podcast, I'm not gonna refer to this uh, in the uh, midterm at all, but I'd recommend listening to it because he goes into some description about how in some cases, especially early, uh, uh, early translations of the Odyssey and the Iliad. Did anybody have to read the Odyssey and the Iliad uh, by Homer, epic Greek uh, poetry? Um, used, did not use the term blue for anything. Uh, so they didn't use the term blue to describe the language, to describe uh, the ocean or the sea. Um, and there's a famous description. Uh, it says, why is the color of honey faces pale with fear. If you're Homer, one of the most influential poets in human history, 
that color is green and the sea is wine dark, just like oxen, those sheep are violet, which all sounds really off. Uh, and the idea was that blue seemed to be not available as a description uh, to people who were writing the Odyssey, to Homer, uh, when he was writing the Odyssey in ancient Greek. Uh, that blue, although we associate blue and white with Greece now, right, it's the color of the Greek flag, right? I mean, when you think of Greece, you think of that bright blue color, uh, and you think of white. Uh, it doesn't show up in epic Greek poetry from ancient times, possibly because it hadn't entered the language yet, uh, and possibly because uh, there weren't many things that were blue. Uh, and that would imply that things that we think of as blue now, we would have had to have another term for. So Homer would have used other words for the sea. Um, I recommend listening to this because the linguist, uh, Guy Deutscher in this case, suggests that he actually tried to raise his youngest daughter without using the word blue uh, and wondered if it would mean that uh, his daughter would not notice that the sky was blue because the sky isn't usually blue. It's almost never blue around here. Uh, and even when it isn't overcast, it's usually kind of whitish, right? Or kind of grayish. It doesn't usually show up as blue unless you're, you know, unless you're maybe at the, the beach or something or uh, on a really bright, uh, you, you know, we're looking out, is there any blue out there? There is no blue out there. Um, so it isn't often blue. Maybe we didn't see the sky as blue uh, until we had the word blue to see it. You all remember this from a long time ago. Um, this was like sort of, was it like six or seven years ago? Um, what color is this dress? No one is, knows for, no one ever agrees, right? There was a disagreement. How many of you see this as the blue dress? How many of you still see that? Is there a small subset of you that see it as a white uh, and gold dress? I see the white and gold dress. Isn't it weird how everybody, how there's no consistency. So how many are the blue black? It really is a blue black dress. And of course, that's one of the complex things about this is that uh, it's a bad picture of a dress that is uh, blue and black. But a lot of us, and I'm in this group, a minority of us, how many were the gold white people? Some of us see it as gold and white and it's really hard to switch. Can anybody switch at will between the two? There are some people that can have a bi, what's called a bi-stable image, which means that you can see both, not simultaneously, but you can switch back and forth. But most of us, this is not a bi-stable image. If you see this as a blue and black dress, you're sort of stuck seeing it as blue and black, and you wonder what's wrong with the people <laughs> like me who see it as gold and white. And you're like, that's not gold and that's not white, so why do you insist? Um, Color is a really tricky thing. And once you have this, um, once you have a word for something and you start describing it as a color, you don't realize that there are other interpretations. So it's plausible that in Homer's time, the sea and the sky did not look blue because they didn't have the word blue for it. Perhaps maybe they saw the sky and the sea in different colors. So the world of color is organized in lots of complex and interesting ways. Um, for us, for, human, uh, for humans who speak English, English speaking human beings, uh, not non-human primates, not speakers of any other language. If you're an English speaker, uh, you grow up speaking English, this is the color of things that you might label green. This is the color of things you might label blue. You might label a lot of these purple, but there's a lot of things on the boundary. And most of those colors on the boundary are ones that are kind of like the dress, they flip back and forth, depending on what your concept is, right? Um, so I've labeled this as sort of the green category, very unambiguous that this is green here in the middle, but some of these are clearly more yellowish. And depending on the context and depending on the things, the comparisons that you might see with that, you might be tempted to label them as either yellow or sometimes as green. Right? So the boundaries of most categories for color are kind of fuzzy, but the center of the category is usually really clear. Uh, and in fact, it's so clear that for most of these at the center of these categories, there exists something that we would call a focal color. So if, you're an, if you have an English speaking, English speakers uh, worldview of the color categories, there's usually one red that we can all agree is the right color of red. It's the most red red there is. And we can usually agree with the, that there's a good green and there's a good blue, right? Um, 
And we can also agree that there are bad examples. So these are blue, but they're not the best blue, right? They're blue colors, but we wouldn't pick that out as the exemplar uh, or the perfect example of blue. We might pick something like this or like this or like this, uh, somewhere in the center of the category as the best example. So that would sort of be the prototype of our category. That's the center of the category. And that's the one that we would all label. That might be the representation of this basic level category. When I think of blue, that's what I think of. And when I think of red, uh, I think of something over here. When I think of yellow, I think of something in the center, even though these others might fall in that boundary. But there's lots of other languages and other languages might divide color space in the same way. And in fact, for some languages, uh, like uh, people who speak uh, Barinmo, for example, uh, this green and blue category get lumped together with the same term. Uh, so if you speak a language that lumps greenish and bluish things together, that means that you're seeing all of those objects, regardless of what color is being refracted back by light to your eye, you're giving them the same linguistic uh, value. You're giving them the same name. So if you only have one word for these objects, can you perceive the difference among them as readily as someone who has two words? In other words, we might disagree where the boundaries are, but if we see this and we see this, we know that one of them is green and one of them is blue, right? We could really tell the difference and categorical perception would suggest that that difference is uh, really pronounced because we give them different names. We clearly know those are different colors. Whereas we might not know we might tell, you know, be able to tell all of these things are somewhat greenish. And in fact, we might not even be able to keep track of which green color we saw because we labeled them all as green. That would also be consistent with the idea of categorical perception. It's all being labeled as the same thing. And so we tend to minimize the differences. We maximize the differences between categories and we minimize differences within the category. So if you have one word that corresponds to these things, the prediction of linguistic determinism of Worf's hypothesis is that you can't really tell the difference between what we think of as blue and what we think of as green. These have the same label, and so they would be indistinguishable or less distinguishable to you because you don't have two different words for them. That's the strong prediction there. So how do we get about how do we go about testing that? So Eleanor Roche, if you remember from last week, Eleanor Roche, who was uh, one of the psychologists I said, uh, helped to transform the idea of uh, concepts and categories from one that emphasized definitions and rules to one that emphasizes uh, family resemblance, was also really interested in this idea of linguistic determinism and color categorization. Uh, the Dani people in Papua New Guinea uh, have two words for colors. Uh, in their language, there are two basic color terms, one for lighter colors and one for darker colors. So that entire universe of colors is basically cut up into two spaces, dark things and light things. So one, what we would might refer to as blue, green, and black gets one word and red, yellow, and white uh, gets another word. That doesn't mean that there aren't secondary level, uh, secondary order distinctions. Uh, you know, combinations of words and so on. Uh, but the basic level color categories is just two. Um, and what she did in an experimental setting, which I'll go through in more detail in the next few slides, is she basically taught them to remember individual color cards. So a memory task where you have to remember individual color cards, uh, pairing them with some new label. And what she reasoned was that if people have access to a basic level color term that corresponds to a focal color, that those would be easier to remember. So when you see red, or when you see blue, it's easy to remember the next time because you say that was the red one. Even if you had to learn to put a letter uh, to say that blue was always number, or a number rather, blue is always number two, red is always number four. It's an arbitrary label, but you could learn them really well because you have the name already. You can say, I'm seeing yellow, I'm seeing blue, I'm seeing green. But when you're seeing some of these in-between colors, it's harder for you because you don't exactly have a name for it. And so now you have to remember, did I see this one or this one? And I'm not really sure anymore which one of those 
two I saw because they kind of look the same because I didn't have a name for them. They're not focal colors and they didn't correspond to my label as well. So they're on that fuzzy boundary, which means that it's gonna be harder to learn. So what she figured is that if she tested English people, they should show an advantage for the focal colors. And when she tested the Donnie people, they should show an advantage uh, for dark, light and dark colors. So they would not show an advantage for English focal colors because they don't have the terms that English speakers do. That would be really strong proof for the linguistic determinism hypothesis. Um, so what she did, and this is one of the papers is back in the early 1970s, universals in color naming and memory. Uh, and suggested that even among cultures that have only two words for colors, there seem to be universal color categories. So they may not have a term for blue and red, but they have uh, access to those basic level colors anyway, and they can remember them better than the in-between colors. So here's what she did. Let's look at one of the experiments, and I've just sort of uh, screen capped uh, from the, the journal. Uh, experiment three was designed in two parts. An English speaking group was tested. Uh, so this is sort of like your English speaking control in this case. Um, this was intended primarily as a replication of Brown and Lennonberg's findings. So they just wanted to determine, are there focal colors for English speakers? So we need to know that in our sample, people will show this focal color advantage. And a Donny group was tested. And this was intended to test the hypothesis that memory differences between focal and non-focal colors exist when codability differences do not. The two groups were given identical tasks so that possible interactions between culture and stimulus type uh, could be measured. So here's what they did. Um, essentially identical for the two different groups of people. Uh, so test chips were mounted uh, on white cards. And these were kind of like the paint cards that you might pick up if you go to the paint store, you go to the Benjamin Moore store, the Home Depot, whatever, and you see all the colors there, right? And there's like uh, 400 different versions of a white, right? You don't exactly which white you want to get, but you get the right white. So you get those color cards and they're sort of on a, they can be matte or gloss or whatever. Um, and that's a standard way to view color. So she took color cards like that. They would be standardized across all of the participants. Um, they were shown a single test chip, a single color for five seconds, waited 30 seconds, and then was shown the entire 160 chip array, which was like that one that I showed you a few slides ago. So that's your task. You're gonna see a single color, and then you're gonna see 130 colors, and you're gonna ask, did you see that color? Uh, so you need to remember the color you saw so that you can pick it out of, pick it out of the lineup of 130 different things. Um, and asked to select the chip that they had seen. The 30 second delay was not filled with any activity. The array was covered with the white cardboard during the presentation of chip and the weight. Test chips were presented to subjects in random order. After each testing, the cards were shuffled so that each subject saw colors in a different order. S, by the way, stands in for subject in olden times in uh, sort of uh, papers that you might read from the 1950s or 1960s, use the S. So we're just gonna measure how quickly they can do it and we're gonna measure their performance. So here's what it was like. You might see a color like this for five seconds and then which one did you see? Well, I don't know. I saw one of the greenish ones, right? But was it this one? Not clear. So you could probably get the column and maybe you could do a pretty good job. I think it might've been this one, but I'm not sure. How about this color? Five seconds to look at it. Did you see that? Is, can you find that color? Can you pick it out? I feel less confident because on this one, I'm not even sure which column. At least on the first one, I feel like I could find the right column. But on this one, I can't even find the column. It might be this one, it might be this one. Um, and so here's an example. So these might be, these should be easier for us because these correspond to something that we have a name for. These correspond to, well, actually, they don't look as good as I thought they would look. Uh, this corresponds to a, a, an orange. Uh, this is also an orange. This is a type of green. This is a type of blue. Uh, this is a type of red. Whereas the colors further down here are less clear what the names should be. Maybe that's a periwinkle. Maybe that's a maroon color. That might be a bluish, but I don't even have names for these others, right? I would have to say brownish or tan-ish. 
or off-white or something like that. But it's clear that there's no name. So what she found was that some things were easy to name, some things harder to name. Um, and so let's look at some of the results from this experiment. For our American subjects, for the focal colors, in other words, for the one example of red that most people can pick out as being a good example of red, and they can name really quickly, um, people were pretty quick to make, uh, they, 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 were, they had a high level of percent correct. Um, when, when they made the correct response, they were pretty quick. And when they made an incorrect response, it took them a little bit longer. And you notice that as they, saw these internominal, in other words, things that didn't have clear, things that were inside the category boundary, but not focal colors, took them longer, and they made fewer correct responses. And when they were boundary colors, things that were on the boundary between one category and the other, they made fewer correct responses, and it took them almost as long to name it or to find it as they did when they made mistakes uh, on the uh, easier to name ones. So not, as, a, not a, as easily able to pick them out, and it takes them longer to find them when they're on the boundary. What she also found, which is really interesting, and this is, I think, the main finding here, uh, is that the, the Donnie subjects who only had two words, dark and light, showed the same pattern. Uh, now, they were slower overall. They made more errors, uh, and it took them longer uh, to uh, make some of the responses. But generally speaking, they showed the same pattern, the same advantage for focal colors, even though they didn't have the name. So that seems to be evidence against the strong version of linguistic determinism. Here's a language spoken by a group of people that only has two terms for colors, and yet they're showing, a, they're showing an advantage for these basic, basic level categories, which correspond to basic physiology of the eye and correspond with the chemical properties of objects that reflect that light. So she says, in summary, the results for memory accuracy were highly consistent. Focal colors were remembered more accurately than non-focal colors by Americans and Donnie. The difference between the internominal and boundary colors was not significant for either culture. So in other words, it doesn't matter which language you speak, you still show an advantage, at least for color. It's basic enough, it's physiological enough that the language you speak doesn't change your picture of the universe. So that strong claim of Worf uh, seems to not be supported uh, by this evidence. So there was no interaction between culture and treatment. That is the direction of differences was the same uh, within both cultures. Look at a few other examples beyond color. Um, and I talk about these in the textbook as well. Uh, Barbara Malt has done some research in the same area looking at objects. So one possibility is color might be too constrained to physiology, right? Uh, objects reflect light in a certain way and your eye has evolved to tell the difference. You've got three different kinds of cones in your eye anyway, short, medium, and long. They correspond to different wavelengths of light. And so it's no surprise that you can tell the difference between red and blue, whether or not you have a word for it, because your eye can tell the difference between red and blue in terms of which cones are more active. But Malt was interested in wondering whether or not objects that are given different names in different languages are perceived in different ways. Um, so for this group of objects, the little uh, like talcum powder, this is a large gallon-sized jug of milk, it's a bottle of mustard, a jar of peanut butter, a baby bottle, and a bottle of maple syrup. And there's a lot of different varieties here. So what she noticed is that for this class of objects, they might be given different words in English. You might say jug, jar, and bottle depending on the object and the shape of the object and the size of the object. And English speakers can reliably call this um, a jug versus a, a jar versus a bottle versus uh, a bottle or a container and so on. This class of objects might all be called frasco in Spanish. And so what she noticed was that depending on what language the perceiver was operating with, uh, they might give a different uh, term to each one of these. So one term in Spanish uh, and at least three different terms for these objects uh, in English. 
So if there's a strong linguistic determinism operating, it would suggest that Spanish speakers would minimize the perceptual differences between those objects because they've given them the same name, activated the same concept, whereas English speakers might uh, maximize the differences between those because they've given it a different label. Um, but she didn't find that to be the case. When she asked participants, Spanish-speaking participants and English-speaking participants to group them together in terms of just overall similarity, not by name, but by similarity, the groupings were roughly the same. People put the tall, skinny ones together, uh, the short ones with the lids together. It didn't matter that they were given the same name in Spanish and different names in English. They were grouped together in roughly the same way. So the language might offer different ways to think about the objects and different ways to talk about the objects, but it doesn't change the way you perceive the object when you're asked to perceive the features of the object. So when given a featural task, a purely perceptual task, both groups of participants performed in the same way. So again, this is not a strong, this, this tends to undermine this strong version of linguistic determinism. There are some cases where linguistic relativity does seem to interact with people's ability to um, make quick decisions though. So it does change the way in which you sometimes think about sentences and think about terms and objects. Uh, and this is work uh, that was done by uh, Lara Boroditsky, who's a, a cognitive scientist. One of the things she's done is looking at the metaphors that different cultures and languages use to talk about things. We mentioned back in the first half, by the way, conceptual metaphors for things like arguments and time and money and so on, and you know, truthfulness being straight and that kind of thing. So our language has lots of metaphors and lots of languages have the same metaphors, but other languages have slightly different metaphors. And what she noticed was that Mandarin speaking uh, tends to use a vertical axis when thinking and talking about time. So time starts from the top and goes to the bottom. Time is an up and down thing metaphorically uh, in Mandarin, whereas it tends to be horizontal more often in English. It doesn't mean that either language has the inability to perceive it in the other way. It's just that the language use tends to emphasize horizontal up and down uh, in Mandarin speaking and uh, sorry, vertical up and down in Mandarin speaking and horizontal uh, in English speaking. Things like pushing deadlines back and moving meetings forward. And so she wondered if this would uh, change the access. So if you tend to use language that emphasizes horizontal or vertical, uh, do you make decisions or you know, do you read things in slightly different ways? Uh, and in her, in her experiment, subjects were shown a prime. They were shown an, a, a, a visual depiction of something that was either horizontal or vertical. So here's our horizontal prime. It's just an image that shows one black ball in front of the other or a white ball following a black ball. The point is, it gets you thinking uh, sort of horizontally, right? Things are going back and forth. This image should get you thinking vertically because one is on top of the other. There's no language associated here. There's nothing associated with whether you speak English or Mandarin, and there's nothing associated with time or anything like that. It's just, here's a thing where the objects are oriented vertically. Here's a thing where the objects are oriented horizontally. And now they were asked to confirm or disconfirm simple temporal propositions. In other words, true or false, March comes earlier than April. Earlier in this case, does not use the vertical or the horizontal, it's time-based? Obviously the answer is yes. And so the question is, are you faster to say yes if the prime sets you up for the kind of way in which you naturally think about time? If you are a Mandarin speaker uh, and your preferred metaphor for thinking about time is this vertical idea, um, if you see the vertical prime, you should answer this a little bit more quickly because you're already thinking vertically. You're already thinking about the top and bottom. So it's easier to say quickly, yes, that's a true statement. If you're a vertical thinker and you're primed with a horizontal, it takes you just a few milliseconds to get back to your preferred way of thinking to answer that question. And the reverse should be true. If you're an English speaker, who tends to think about time as 
horizontal back and forth. And then you see March comes earlier than April. You've got this horizontal prime. You should be a little bit faster than if you see the horizontal. So you get the horizontal prime. You should be faster than if you see the vertical prime. So if the prime is aligned with your metaphorical way of thinking about time, you're faster to confirm or disconfirm the propositions. And that's the, those are the, essentially the results that she found. After a vertically oriented prime, Mandarin speakers were faster to confirm or disconfirm temporal propositions than if they were shown the horizontal prime and the reverse effect was seen in the English speakers. So both groups showed the effect. Uh, it had to do with the prime orienting you to think about time in the way that your native language prioritizes it. These language differences predict aspects of temporal reasoning by speakers. So this sounds more like that slightly different version of linguistic relativity, that there might be some small differences between speakers of a different language uh, in terms of how they think about things. And in this case, uh, the difference is that you're faster to access this uh, temporal reasoning if you're primed to think about time in the way that you usually think about time in your language. Uh, Follow-up research uh, essentially showed that this is a fairly malleable effect though. Uh, it's not set in stone. So a group of English speakers uh, were then asked, given lots of examples of how English language also uses uh, verticality in time. So we do think about time, calendar time, as proceeding from the top of the month to the bottom. You might hear expressions like the top of the hour if you're thinking about time on a, uh, on a clock face, right? That's the top of the hour and the bottom of the hour. Um, and so we also have metaphors that are vertical in nature. And so after some short description of what those metaphors are, um, the priming effect could also be reversed. So it's not a very strong effect. It doesn't constrain you to think about time in one way or the other. It just suggests that you have a preferred way uh, to think about time. So this might also be evidence against the stronger linguistic determinism. The language isn't determining what you can think about. It just influences the way in which you access information. OK, um, final example. Uh, we should be finished right at about 12 o'clock. Uh, the final example, and I've got a link here that you can read uh, later. This is a little bit of background reading, um, mostly because it's just a short description of the research that I'm gonna talk about. So if you wanna see the broader background, uh, there's a short blog post that I had written uh, a number of years ago about this. And the idea is that language, the way you speak and the way you write can also give others an insight into the way you think about things and an insight into your cognitive abilities. I mean, we kind of know that instinctively, right? Uh, you, can, you can change the way people think of you by changing the way you speak, right? You can speak with a different accent uh, and if you change your accent, it can change what people, you know, the perception that people have of you. You can use more word, you can use more complicated words. You can use shorter words or longer words or more archaic words in order to convey different things to people about what you're thinking and how you think about things. You can change people's perception of your intellectual ability uh, by changing the way you talk, right? I mean, we all do that. Uh, we speak in different ways in different contexts. Sometimes it's unavoidable though. Um, and this is a really good example of using computer science to understand something about cognition. Uh, this is a, a study that was done um, at the University of Toronto between uh, someone who's in the Department of Computer Sciences and also in the Department of English. So a collaboration between the humanities and computer science. And what they were wondering was, it's long been suspected that the English novelist, the greatest selling novelist of all time in the English language uh, is Agatha Christie. Uh, she wrote novels in the 20th century, like The Murder on the Orient Express, and a lot of things that continue to be influential even to this day. How many of you saw the movie? Um, oh, what was the movie that was, it wasn't Knives Out, but it was the second one. What was it even called? Glass Onion. How many of you saw Glass Onion or Knives Out? Both of them Agatha Christie style murders, because in Agatha Christie murders, usually what happens uh, is that people are gathered together. That's this prototypical one, right? From different walks of life, a murder happens, 
And then the detective has to figure it out. And then at the end, calls everybody in together to announce how they solved the crime. That's the prototypical Agatha Christie story. So Glass Onion was a variant of Murder on the Orient Express, uh, which was one of her most famous stories. One of the things that was long suspected is that she continued to write long after she was diagnosed, uh, would have been diagnosed uh, with um, Alzheimer's disease. It was never known if she was, had Alzheimer's. People suspected that she might have been suffering from dementia later in her career, despite the fact that she continued to write. Um, so one of, the one of the things that happened uh, is others who were known to suffer from Alzheimer's, uh, it turned out that their vocabulary changed later in life. They used fewer words and they used simpler words uh, and they tended to use more nondescript words. So if that happens in someone who is known to have Alzheimer's dementia, we can use that to analyze the written output of someone like Agatha Christie, who we don't know, but might have suspected uh, was suffering from Alzheimer's. And so that's what they did. They read all of this into different computer models. So a lot of her books were read and then analyzed for, textual con for, for text content. And here's some of the things that they discovered. Um, for example, uh, she was 28 when she wrote her first, the first novel they looked at and 82 when they looked at the, for the novel that she wrote uh, at the end. So that's a pretty big career. She's written a lot more than this. This is just a sampling of the books that she's written uh, from 28 uh, to 82. And one of the things that they noticed was that the types of words started to reduce, uh, repeated word phrases started to increase. In other words, she started using a lot of the same phrases throughout the, same, throughout the book. Uh, fewer words, more repeats, um, and also more, and this is the really key one, towards the very end, more indefinite words like things uh, or people, things that are not, you know, words that don't refer to specifics, but are kind of generic words. So it's sparser. There's fewer words, there's more repeated words, and there's more of these indefinite uh, words as she got older. And that this suggests that there might have been a cognitive decline between 28 and 82, uh, which in this case, it wasn't it was never diagnosed as Alzheimer's, but long suspected. And these kinds of computer science analyses uh, suggest that it's possible to infer things about uh, the mind of the person who generated the text uh, by looking at just the language output. Last example, um, people have also looked at this in terms of people's use of absolute terms. Uh, whether it has to do with markers uh, for things like anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. Uh, so in this particular study, um, and I'll go through this one kind of quickly because um, we're just getting towards the end, uh, they looked at, they scraped a lot of terms from discussion groups. Uh, so you might imagine being in an internet forum uh, and discussing mental health, just like you might be in an internet forum and discussing uh, hobbies or discussing health, discussing uh, childbirth, lots of discussion forums, whether it's Reddit or otherwise, exist for topics of discussion, right? Facebook groups exist for topics of discussion. And what they were looking at, well, what are the kinds of words that people use in groups that focus on uh, mental health or depression? So if you're in a chat group uh, or if you're in a discussion group and you're discussing uh, things like uh, your current state, uh, whether it's... Um, uh, different kinds of uh, groups focused on PTSD uh, or borderline personality or general depression, um, there tends to be a higher usage of these so-called absolutist words. In other words, there's less ambiguity, more absolutism. Things are awful as opposed to I had a bad day. That might be an example of absolute words versus uh, more contextual words. And this seems to be something that was not seen as much in controls, uh, but seen higher in groups associated with anxiety and depression uh, or suicidal ideation. So the level of mental health concerns that were the focus of these groups uh, tended to bring out more absolute terms. Again, the linguistic output seems to give some window uh, into the thought process of the individual generating those uh, terms. Does that seem clear? Is this the final slide? Is there one more? Two more? <laughs>
Okay, so a conclusion slide, and then we, I'll just re reiterate the um, exam that's coming up in just a bit. Uh, so language influences our thinking, and it summarizes uh, what we're thinking about. Uh, we often think with an inner language, and that's true. I mean, can you think about something without activating your language? I mean, it's not easy, is it? I mean, as soon as I act, ask you to think about something, you probably are saying to yourself, okay, think about something without using language, using inner language to tell yourself to think about something. It's really hard to have a thought and then be aware of that thought without using some kind of inner language to access that thought. So we access our thoughts by language. I mean, memories are, in, are you know, influencing our behavior all the time, but when we want to have conscious access to it and we really want to know what our what the contents of our thoughts are, we usually probe our thoughts by asking ourselves a question with some kind of inner language. And then we think about it with a, a running inner dialogue. So we think and talk to ourselves while maintaining this inner dialogue. Um, the stronger forms of linguistic relativity don't hold up, but the weaker forms, the relative forms, the deterministic forms don't, but the relative forms do seem to hold up. Your language does influence what you think about. Okay, um, this is the slide that I had at the beginning, but in case anybody wasn't here at the beginning, just to remind you, first of all, quiz one begin, quiz two rather begins uh, in 30 minutes. Uh, so it should be there. It'll be there all day. You can take it anytime, whenever you've got time for it. Uh, it's only gonna take you 15 minutes. Midterm exam is, here in this room at class time one week from today. So at 9.30 on February 14th, uh, Tuesday, here in this classroom, 3M3250, we will gather for our midterm exam. You know what's gonna be on the midterm exam. It's gonna be stuff from classes one through five. And you know what's gonna be on the midterm, ex what's gonna be on the midterm exam are gonna be things that we've uh, covered both in class and in lecture. That's the primary way uh, to sort of guess, to, to make a good educated guess about what I'm gonna emphasize. Things that I've talked about in class that also appear in the textbook. Does that mean that stuff in the textbook that I didn't talk about is gonna, will also show up? Yes, that stuff may also show up. Uh, it just won't be as much of a proportion of the exam. The exam will center on those things that I talk about in both cases. Are there examples of things that I talk about in class which are not in the textbook, which will also show up on the exam? Yes, also. But again, if you really wanna maximize your chances, I would, do, I would study both of those things. I'd use your notes as a guide uh, to, to help you emphasize what the most important things are, what's most likely to be emphasized on that midterm exam. Fill in the background with the textbook and also make sure you can recognize all of the bold terms and be able to define them, uh, be able to pick them out of a multiple choice uh, scenario. You'll have three hours. Uh, it's not, uh, the exam shouldn't take three hours. The exam should take most people about an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, on average, that's when most people finish the exam. You've got the full two hour or full three hours uh, at your disposal, but you may not need it. Okay, so that's here next week. But then after that, you can relax because we have break week. And I hope you all enjoy break week uh, and come back refreshed wherever you're going, whether it's just here in London, uh, back home uh, to wherever that is, or if you're going on vacation somewhere outside of uh, the region, somewhere nice or somewhere warm or somewhere cold, I hope you enjoy it. All right, see you back here next week. I'm <laughs> <laughs>